Chapter 14 of the Abominations of Modern Society. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Abominations of Modern Society by Thomas DeWitt Talmadge. Chapter 14 Lies, White and Black. There are ten thousand ways of telling a lie. A man's entire life may be a falsehood, while with his lips he may not once directly falsify. There are those who state what is positively untrue, but afterwards say, may be, softly. These departures from the truth are called white lies, but there is really no such thing as a white lie. The whitest lie that was ever told was as black as perdition. No inventory of public crimes will be sufficient that omits this gigantic abomination. There are men, high in church and state, actually useful, self-denying, and honest in many things, who, upon certain subjects and in certain spheres, are not at all to be depended upon for veracity. Indeed, there are multitudes of men who have their notions of truthfulness so thoroughly perverted that they do not know when they are lying. With many, it is called a cultivated sin. With some, it seems a natural infirmity. I have known people who seem to have been born liars. The falsehoods of their lives extended from cradle to grave. Prevarication, misrepresentation, and dishonesty of speech appeared in their first utterances, and was as natural to them as any of their infantile diseases, and was a sort of moral croup or spiritual scarlatina. But many have been placed in circumstances where this tendency has day by day and hour by hour been called to larger development. They have gone from attainment to attainment, and from class to class, until they have become regularly graduated liars. The air of the city is filled with falsehoods, they hang pendant from the chandeliers of our finest residences. They crowd the shelves of some of our merchant princes. They fill the sidewalk from curbstone to brownstone facing. They cluster around the mechanic's hammer and blossom from the end of the merchant's yardstick and sit in the doors of churches. Some call them fiction. Some style them fabrication. You might say that they were subterfuge, disguise, delusion, romance, evasion, pretense, fable, deception, misrepresentation. But, as I am ignorant of anything to be gained by the hiding of a God-defying outrage under the lexicographer's blanket, I shall chiefly call them what my father taught me to call them, lies. I shall divide them into agricultural, mercantile, mechanical, and ecclesiastical lies, leaving those that are professional, social, and political, for some other chapter. First, then, I will speak of those that are more particularly agricultural. There is something in the perpetual presence of natural objects to make a man pure. The trees never issue false stock. Wheat fields are always honest. Rye and oats never move out in the night, not paying for the place they have occupied. Corn shocks never make false assignments. Mountain brooks are always current. The gold on the grain is never counterfeit. The sunrise never flaunts its false colours. The Jew sports only genuine diamonds. Taking farmers as a class, I believe they are truthful and fair in dealing and kind-hearted. But the regions surrounding our cities do not always send this sort of men to our markets. Day by day, there creep through our streets and about the market houses, farm wagons that have not an honest spoke in their wheels, or a truthful rivet from tongue to tailboard. During the last few years, there have been times when domestic economy has foundered on the farmer's firkin. Neither high taxes, nor the high price of dry goods, nor the exorbitancy of labour, could excuse much that the city has witnessed in the behaviour of the yeomanry. By the quiet firesides of Westchester and Bucks counties, I hope there may be seasons of deep reflection and hearty repentance. 
Rural districts are accustomed to rail at great cities as given up to fraud and every form of unrighteousness But our cities do not absorb all the abominations Our citizens have learned the importance of not always trusting to the size and style of apples in the top of a farmer's barrel as an indication of what may be found farther down Many of our people are accustomed to watch to see how correctly a bushel of beets is measured and there are not many honest milk cans deceptions do not all cluster around city halls when our cities sit down and weep over their sins all the surrounding counties ought to come in and weep with them there is often hostility on the part of producers against traders as though the man who raises the corn were necessarily more honorable than the grain dealer who pours it into his mammoth bin there ought to be no such hostility the occupation of one is as necessary as that of the other yet producers often think it no wrong to snatch away from the trader and they say to the bargain maker you get your money easy do they get it easy let those who in the quiet field and barn get their living exchange places with those who stand today amid the excitements of commercial life and see if they find it so very easy why the farmer goes to sleep with the assurance that his corn and barley will be growing all the night moment by moment adding to his revenue the merchant tries to go to sleep conscious that that moment his cargo may be broken on the rocks or damaged by the wave that sweeps clear across the hurricane deck or that the gold gamblers may that very hour be plotting some monetary revolution or the burglars be prying open his cafe or his debtors fleeing the town or his landlord raising the rent or the fires kindling on the block that contains all his estate easy is it god help the merchant it is hard to have the palms of the hand blistered with outdoor work but a more dreadful process when through mercantile anxieties the brain is consumed in the next place we notice mercantile lies those before the counter and behind the counter i will not attempt to specify the different forms of commercial falsehood there are merchants who excuse themselves for deviation from truthfulness because of what they call commercial custom in other words the multiplication and universality of a sin turns it into a virtue there have been large fortunes gathered where there was not one drop of unrequited toil in the wine Not one spark of bad temper flashing from the bronze bracket Not one drop of needlewoman's heart blood in the crimson plush While there are other great establishments in which there is not one doorknob not one brick not one trinket Not one thread of lace, but has upon it the mark of dishonor What wonder if some day a hand of toil that has been wrung and worn out and blistered until the skin came off should be placed against the elegant wallpaper leaving its mark of blood four fingers and a thumb or that some days walking the halls there should be a voice accosting the occupant saying six cents for making a shirt and flying the room another voice should say twelve cents for an army blanket and the man should try to sleep at night but ever and anon be aroused until getting up on one elbow he should shriek out who's there there are thousands of fortunes made in commercial spheres that are throughout righteousness god will let his favor rest upon every scroll every pictured wall every traceried window and the joy that flashes from the lights and showers from the music and dances in the children's quick feet pattering through the hall will utter the congratulation of men and the approval of god the merchant can to the last item be thoroughly honest there is never any need for falsehood yet how many will day by day hour by hour utter what they know to be wrong you say that you are selling at less than cost if so then it is right to say it but did that thing cost you less than what you ask for it if not then you have lied you have said that article cost you twenty five dollars did it if so then all right if it did not then you have lied suppose you are a purchaser you are beating down the goods you say that that article for which five dollars is charged is not worth more than four is it worth no more than four dollars then all right 
if it be worth more and for the sake of getting it for less than its value you willfully depreciate it you have lied you may call it sharp trade the recording angel writes it down on the ponderous tomes of eternity mr so-and-so merchant on water street or in eighth street or in state street or mrs so-and-so keeping house on beacon street or on madison avenue or rittenhouse square told one lie you may consider it insignificant because relating to an insignificant purchase you would despise the man who would falsify in regard to some great matter in which the city or the whole country was concerned but this is only a box of buttons or a row of pins or a case of needles be not deceived the article purchased may be so small you can put it in your vest pocket but the sin was bigger than the pyramids and the echo of the dishonor will reverberate through all the mountains of eternity you throw out on your counter some specimens of handkerchiefs your customer asks is that all silk no cotton in it you answer it is all silk was it all silk if so all right but was it partly cotton then you have lied moreover you lost by the falsehood the customer though he may live at lynn or doylestown or poughkeepsie will find out that you defrauded him and next spring when he again comes shopping he will look at your sign and say i will not try there that is the place where i got that handkerchief so that by that one dishonest bargain you picked your own pocket and insulted the almighty would you dare to make an estimate of how many falsehoods in trade were yesterday told by hardware men and clothiers and fruit dealers and dry goods establishments and importers and jewellers and lumbermen and coal merchants and stationers and tobacconists lies about saddles about buckles about ribbons about carpets about gloves about coats about shoes about hats about watches about carriages about books about everything in the name of the lord almighty i arraign commercial falsehoods as one of the greatest of abominations in city and town in the next place i notice mechanical lies there is no class of men who administer more to the welfare of the city than artisans to their hand we must look for the building that shelters us for the garments that clothe us for the car that carries us they wield a widespread influence there is much derision of what is called muscular christianity but in the latter day of the world's prosperity i think that the christian will be muscular we have the right to expect of those stalwart men of toil the highest possible integrity many of them answer all our expectations and stand at the front of religious and philanthropic enterprises but this class like the others that i have named has in it those who lack in the element of veracity they cannot all be trusted in times when the demand for labor is great it is impossible to meet the demands of the public or do work with that promptness and perfection that would at other times be possible but there are mechanics whose word cannot be trusted at any time no man has a right to promise more work than he can do there are mechanics who say that they will come on monday but they do not come until wednesday you put work in their hands that they tell you shall be completed in ten days but it is thirty there have been houses built of which it might be said that every nail driven every foot of plastering put on every yard of pipe laid every shingle hammered every brick mortared could tell a falsehood connected therewith there are men attempting to do ten or fifteen pieces of work who have not the time or strength to do more than five or six pieces but by promises never fulfilled keep all the undertakings within their own grasp this is what they call nursing the job how much wrong to his soul and insult to god a mechanic would save if he promised only so much as he expected to be able to do society has no right to ask of you impossibilities you cannot always calculate correctly and you may fail because you cannot get the help that you anticipate but now i am speaking of the willful making of promises that you know you cannot keep did you say that that shoe should be mended that coat repaired those brick laid that harness sewed 
that door grained that spout fixed or that window glazed by saturday knowing that you would neither be able to do it yourself nor get anyone else to do it then before god and man you are a liar you may say that it makes no particular difference and that if you had told the truth you would have lost the job and that people expect to be disappointed but that excuse will not answer there is a voice of thunder rolling among the drills and planes and shoe lasts and shears which says all liars shall have their place in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone i next noticed ecclesiastical lies that is falsehoods told for the purpose of advancing churches and sects or for the purpose of depleting them there is no use asking many a calvinist what an arminian believes for he will be apt to tell you that the arminian believes that a man can convert himself or to ask the arminian what the calvinist believes for he will tell you that the calvinist believes that god made some men just to damn them there is no need of asking a pedo baptist what a baptist believes for he will be apt to say that the baptist believes immersion to be positively necessary to salvation it is almost impossible for one denomination of christians without prejudice or misrepresentation to state the sentiment of an opposing sect if a man hates presbyterians and you ask him what presbyterians believe he will tell you that they believe there are infants in hell a span long it is strange also how individual churches will sometimes make misstatements about other individual churches it is especially so in regard to falsehoods told with reference to prosperous enterprises as long as a church is feeble and the singing is discordant and the minister through the poverty of the church must go with threadbare coat and here and there a worshipper sits in the end of a pew having all the seat to himself religious sympathizers of other churches will say what a pity but let a great day of prosperity come and even ministers of the gospel who ought to be rejoiced in the largeness and extent of the work denounce and misrepresent and falsify starting the suspicion in regard to themselves that the reason they do not like the corn is because it is not ground in their own mill how long before we shall learn to be fair in our religious criticisms the keenest jealousies on earth are church jealousies the field of christian work is so large that there is no need that our hoe handles hit may god extirpate from the world ecclesiastical lies commercial lies mechanical lies and agricultural lies and make every man the world over to speak truth with his neighbor end of chapter 14